Is there any other admin? No, I don't think so. Good. Um, so this is me. Um, my my job, my kind of role in the world is as a, a writer and performer. Um, I work mostly in poetry, but also intersecting with theatre, live performance, games, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and that journey at the moment has taken me into doing a creative writing PhD. Um, because when else in the world am I going to get paid by the government to write a book for three years? Very exciting. Uh, or think about a book for three years? Who gets to do that? It's wonderful. Um, that PhD is in minority languages, specifically Scots, um, and looking at the role of speculative poetry, science fiction poetry, fantasy imagination in minority language globally. So it is nothing to do with what, what we're talking about today. And I say that to kind of emphasise um, that what I'm talking about today, I come to not really as an academic researcher. That's not my field of, of um, research within the academy, but it is um, a ch big chunk of my field as practice um, as an artist and through my own political engagements. So my thinking, my kind of positionality, um, for today is coming at it as a as a practitioner more than as a formal researcher um, and that's possibly me feeling a bit impostery saying that but it's also um, just to try and locate kind of where I'm coming at you coming at it for you coming coming at it with you I don't know one of those prepositions um, so you have a sense of that uh, so the the political kind of affinities that I've brought to that and my political background, which is as relevant to this as my artistic background, is kind of a lifelong or adult lifelong involvement in various kind of autonomous political movements, direct action movements. Um, starting out in environmental direct action, I was very involved in the last few years of climate camp and some more local stuff in Scotland. Um, and then more recently, um, the, the stuff that I tend to be involved in with Scotland is stuff around mm, no borders work, um, asylum seeker solidarity, um, the little bit of anti-fascism that we need in Scotland just to try and keep them down and stop them getting any kind of size. Anti-fascist protests are really nice in Scotland because it's like the one time you feel like you get to win, like all the time. Um, it's quite nice. Um, and then also stuff around trans health. So that's the, that's the sort of political milieu that I'm coming to this um, from, which will be relevant a little bit in a little bit. Um, and what today, I'm going to kind of cover four um, areas around ideas of access and inclusion and also exclusion, both the kind of positives and negatives of exclusion. And I'm going to start by looking specifically at accessibility policies, policies around disability inclusion, disability access. Um, and then flip over into the arts world and just, I want to look at a couple of pieces of work I've done around disability in the arts um, to kind of look at that from a different end. So um, the accessibility work, I'm going to be looking at education access. So starting with um, access and education and then looking at disability in the arts and then moving back to this kind of policy work um, and thinking about um, the wonderfully contested issue of safer spaces policies within primarily academic spaces, but also where those have come from politically. Um, and then moving back, um, I want to look at some um, artistic engagements around deliberate exclusion. And I suppose uh, the, the provocation that I want to make with this talk or um, the angle that I want to take is to look at some of the ways that inclusion um, operates against marginality, um, against anti-oppression work um, and some forms of exclusion by the margins rather than exclusion of the margins but choosing from the margins not to let people in um, can be exciting interesting full of potential and that's the double meaning of the title for me <coughs> access means it's not for you so looking at how access policy can be deployed to keep people out um, and also how a more radical approach to access um, can also be in a more positive way about keeping people out and what that might be. So that's that's what we're going to cover. Mm. Review it then. Good. So so I want to start with that first section: access um, liberalism and uh, looking at how accessibility uh, operates as a liberal ideology and what the contradictions of that are. So I thought the best place to start um, when I was preparing this talk was Strathclyde's. Um, 
disability accessibility policy, which you can find at this link. Um, and the, the overarching principles of which begin. The University of Strathclyde is committed to the promotion of equal opportunities for disabled people and aims, aims to create an inclusive environment that enables full participation in the university experience and offers disabled staff, students and visitors, where reasonably practicable, an experience comparable to non-disabled people. So those are the overarching principles gathering, gov currently governing access um, at the University of Strathclyde. And there's a few things that I want to draw out apart from this. It's worth, yeah, there's a few things I want to draw out about this. Um, to be a little fair to this policy, this is just the principles bit, and, and as with all access policies, as with all policies anywhere, um, the real meat of it is less in the broad philosophical statement and much more in what's down there in the nitty gritty. And if you're interested in kind of that work, I think a deep analysis of the nitty gritty is, is much more important. And what I'm about to chat about is very kind of broad surface level. The first thing um, that interests me about the wording here is uh, full participation in the university experience. Um, mostly because I'm not, I'm not sure what that experience is. Um, the policy invokes this thing, the university experience. It's a pre-existing thing that we're trying to get disabled people into. The implication is that, dis that disabled people are currently excluded from the university experience, and this policy operates to bring them into this pre-existing thing. I'm not entirely sure what that university's experience is supposed to be, and I think it's worth unpacking the assumptions that are going on there. The university experience um, that we're trying to get people to participate in is by implication something that disabled people aren't in already. Um, it is an abled university experience by the definitions of this policy. So what kind of learnings are going on in there and why would disabled people want access to that thing that, they, that hasn't been defined around them? Um, a little bit more specifically, um, you'll probably have already noticed this, um, the, the killer, the killer um, adverbs and adjectives in this uh, policy statement are um, reasonable and comparable. So, so the University of Strathclyde is committed to the promotion of equal opportunities for disabled people and aims to create an inclusive environment, except it doesn't. It only does that where reasonably practicable. So this statement of access starts by pretending that it says that it wants to enable access for everyone and then only towards the end of the statement says actually we're not interested in access for everyone, we're only interested in access where it's reasonably practicable. Um, so, so we have this killer bit of um, what I'm going to talk about is non-performativity later, um, which is a term from Sarah Ahmed. I'm just going to park non-performative for now because I'm going to talk about it in more detail later. Um, the reasonable word there for people who are access geeks um, is directly from UK legislation. Um, and, and it's, it's often used in international legislation. Um, all workplaces and public institutions are required to enable access for disabled people um, and to make reasonable adjustments. The term, the legal term is reasonable adjustments. Um, and I'm interested in what that word reasonable, what work that word reasonable is doing there. Mm. Um, you find out what work, work, work reasonable is doing when you ask for one of those adjustments to be made. You go to your manager, your line manager, your HR department and say, in order to work at this place, I need this ramp. I need to be able to wear headphones in the office. Um, I need to sit by a window. Um, I need time off um, for counselling, an appointment that I can only get at this specific time in a week. And then your HR manager says, no, I don't think that's reasonable. Um, and then you have to have a contest with your HR manager where you say this is reasonable and they say it's not reasonable and you have to try and win that contest. And that contest is won not only through a process of, of reasoning, of, of, of doing the process of reasoning and arguing and saying the reason I need it is this, this is reasonable because this, um, it's not reasonable to do this. It's also um, a legal process. What institutional resources can you get behind you? What economic resources, what legal resources can you get behind you to do the process of reasoning to say that this adjustment is reasonable? The term reasonable adjustments exposes that reasoning is and always is an economic and legal process as much as it's a rational process, that rationality is pushed through, through legal 
um, personal, social, endless, endless work to make this reasonable thing happen. So that's what reasonably practicable means there. Um, it pretends to be this neutral statement, but what it actually is, is to create an area of contestation, not only to enable disabled people to get what they need, but to enable the institution to refuse. Um, the shadow is always there. The shadow of saying, we're only going to do this where it's reasonable, is so that you can say, this is unreasonable. And then the same work, um, and I won't do this in as much detail, the same work is then done by comparable in the next clause. The, 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 the statement starts by saying, we're committed to the promotion of equal opportunities, we not, we, we're not going to create an inclusive environment, we're just going to aim to create an inclusive environment. So that's the third, <laughs> that's the third, uh, what's the opposite of an intensifier? Um, the third thing to like make this less functional, um, you're not going to do it, you're just going to aim to do it, you're only going to do it when it's reasonable, and you're not actually going to do the thing, you're going to try and do a thing that's comparable to the thing. So this statement of principles is not actually an accessibility statement, it's a non-accessibility statement. It's a statement to give space for a university to, say, to, 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 to not do the work of accessibility happening. Um, I called them here pliable non-specifics, which I think is unnecessarily obfuscatory as a, as a term, but what I mean by that is they're pliable, there is no definition of reasonable, there is no definition of comparable, they're things that you can move with your hands, with the law, with a pile of money to change what they mean, um, and they're non-specific so that you can do that. <laughs> What's going on in this whole statement overall is a specific contradiction that is that characterizes i think all liberal ideology um, which is a contradiction between the promise of full participation and the always present admission that that's impossible um, the statement says that it wants to include everyone and then it in the same breath literally in the same sentence um, says but we know that's not possible, so we're only going to do it when it's reasonable, and we're not going to enable full participation. We're going to give a comparable experience. Um, and this is a contradiction that I'm going to unpack a bit more in a bit. Non-performative, I'll leave for now, because we're going to come back to it. Um, I wanted to look at... An, uh, uh, I could have picked any university, <laughs> and it would have been a bit like this, so I'm not, I'm not bashing where I am, and I'm quite grateful to be here. But I think it's nice to start with the ground where you are. Um, this is the Open University's um, equivalent statement, and I've linked to both of these policies so that in the slides you can compare the nitty-gritty, which is less dissimilar, I think, than, um, than those principles make clear. Before this, the Open University in their, in their policy has an interesting preamble um, about how they have the highest proportion of disabled students of any university, which is something that's shaping this policy. That the Open University is, it set, it defines itself as a university for disabled people, which is interesting, we'll come back to. So, the Open University's mission of being open to people, places, methods and ideas, that's its overarching mission, reflects our commitment to supporting all of our students to achieve success in higher education, regardless of background, circumstances or disabilities. Our aim is to reach students with life-changing learning that meets their needs and enriches societies. We embrace equal opportunities for all. We're not just going to do an equal opportunities policy because we have to, legally. We embrace it within a diverse and inclusive environment. We're not just aiming for diversity, we're saying we are already diverse. Which recognises and responds to the needs of all of our students. This policy sets out our commitment to supporting all of our students in ways that effectively meet their needs and aligns with the student charter and the EU's overall strategies such as the Students First strategy, the Equality Scheme, the Learning and Teaching Vision and Plan, the Widening Access and Success strategy and the Academic strategy. Whew, it's not strategies. Mm. So, um, some of the, the problems, the things that I unpacked in the default language are, are better dealt with here. Like we can see that this is much more far reaching and positive language. Honestly, I thought that the previous vision statement had this sort of begrudging element to it, where it was like, we have to do this stuff legally. So we're just gonna put this statement out there. Whereas this one is kind of having a push at, at saying this is a big part of our vision for the university. Um, but I think there's still some contradictions in there that are interesting to, to look at. Um, the first of which relates to this question of the university experience. Um, 
We've got, I think, four alls. Every time they mention students, they say all of our students, and they also want equal opportunities for all within a diverse and inclusive environment. And what I'm interested in is how they can how they can promise that. How can they meet the needs for all of their students? And what happens when all meets the limits of what they're able to do? What happens when the university meets the limits of society? The Open University because of the economic structure that it has, because of the way it operates, is trying to set itself up to be a university for people who can't study full time, who have disabilities that might disrupt education in all sorts of different ways, um, for people on lower incomes. It is structuring itself around that, but it, it can't, um, it by itself can't address the fact of, of living in a society that, that systemically denies people the resources that they need to live in. Um, so, when they say um, we want to support all of our students to achieve success in higher education, what happens when circumstances outside of the university's control or within the university's control but beyond their capacity deny students that success? What happens when they don't succeed? What happens when they fail and whose fault is it? Usually it's considered socially the fault of the student. Um, what happens if they have an injury that takes them out of the university and the university can't do that? What happens if they have their benefits cut um, and they can't continue with the education? Whose failure is that and what responsibility does the university have? in that circumstance. What happens when the university is rubbing against society, making all of these promises of inclusion for all, and then it literally cannot keep those promises economically and socially? The university's answer to this is to have seven, five, five, six, five or six different strategies to try and deal with all of the contradictions that their promise throws up. There, I think there are six strategies there that it's naming. And this is a, a sort of um, a juridical and managerial approach to liberalism. If we have enough strategies, if we have enough policies, if we lay down enough rules, if we lay down enough visions and aims and strategies and approaches, if we name reality in enough ways, then reality will become this thing that we want it to become. And that's what I... Um, uh, I'm terming access liberalism. It's this managerial approach to access where you can you can deal with the, the problems that thinking about accessibility inevitably throws up, which is that the resources that you need are not there within your institution, within society, um, through enough policies to do it. Uh, so that was a little bit of an analysis just of two statements, and I want to look at the broader um, political context for that. Um, this is a, starts with a quote from um, Robert McGrew, who wrote a, a fantastic book called Crip Theory, um, which is, uh, it's become quite foundational and it's an attempt to apply some of the learning and strategies of queer theory to um, a disability studies, disability studies context. Um, and McGrew takes um, the concept of compulsory heterosexuality and then asks what is compulsory able-bodiedness and one of the ways that he defines it is this the system of compulsory able-bodiedness repeatedly demands that people with disabilities embody for others an affirmative answer to the unspoken question yes but in the end wouldn't you rather be like me um, so we could consider this quote in the uh, in the context of the Paralympics mm where the hyper-achieving, incredibly successful, overcoming, boundary-smashing, disabled athlete um, achieves through all of their impressive work and overcoming of life struggles um, what an abled athlete could do. Um, we're impressed because they are embodying what an abled athlete could do. In the end, wouldn't you rather be like me? You can do what I can do. That's so impressive. Well done. Um, a very cynical way of putting it. I actually love the Paralympics <laughs> and I'm endlessly delighted and I also think there's all sorts of um, agencies and possibilities within that frame. When you actually listen to Paralympic athletes, um, they all have a hyper awareness of this stuff going on. Not all of them, I shouldn't say all. They often have a hyper awareness of this stuff going on and are looking for their own agency within that. Um, but from the able-bodied perspective, that is often the ideology that's going on there, asking people to embody, embody the affirmative answer to the unspoken question. And accessibility, for me, is a, 
um, an example of compulsory able-bodiedness. It maintains an abled view of the world because in this word access, what we're, what we're asking for is for disabled people to access what already exists. Um, it's allowing groups of people to access what already exists within reasonable, within reason, reasonable, if it's reasonable, if they can reason their way through it, and managed by the appropriate institution with all those strategies and policies and aims, rather than processes of transformation. Accessibility isn't a process of transforming an institution, a process of transforming a society, but getting a group that's hitherto been excluded access to what already exists and thereby um, prevents the, um, the institution from transforming. If you can continue bringing more people in, if more people can access your institution, your society, your business, your ideology, then your institution, your ideology doesn't have to change because all of the problems are dealt by bringing more people into that pre-existing thing. What I want to ask of both education and, and the arts for that matter is what happens if you flip that narrative around? Um, and say, what if the job of education, what if the job of accessibility is not to give people access that don't have access, access to what already exists, but to change what already exists by centering it around said marginalised group. And the question there, the provocation there is, what would an education centred on disability look like? Um, what if instead of insisting that we have ramps and lifts in every building, which we should insist and absolutely need, um, we ask, um, how can buildings be designed from the start um, around people who need wheels? What, um, what if the, uh, the social structures on which a university is based, the lecture, the seminar, the informal discussion, the staff meeting is based not on um, a neurotypical form of sociality, but on an autistic form of sociality? Um, what happens if course requirements are based not on um, a, a set of increasingly exhausting metrics, but um, on what somebody who has some form of chronic fatigue, or even just the any form of fatigue that comes with having a disability, what if it's based around that? What if the schedules are based around that rather than based on what a compulsory able-bodied perspective demands? So those are the questions there. How many end of time? Mm. Um, I've talked a lot about liberalism, so I wanted to define it a little bit. Um, I, like, um, I like listening to my enemies' definitions first, because I think that's quite interesting. I love going to John Gray on liberalism, even though he disgusts me. Um, this is John Gray's um, repeated and uh, lifelong definition of liberalism. For the ideal of toleration we have inherited embodies two incompatible philosophies. Viewed from one side, liberal toleration is the ideal of a rational consensus on the best way of life. From the other, it is the belief that human beings can flourish in many ways of life. And this central contradiction, John Gray comes back to over and over and over again in his work, the idea that um, liberalism wants there to be a rational consensus. We bring everyone together, we have an enormous democratic process and we live together in this society where we've rationally decided how we want to live. And at the same time, it says, and everyone can come into that thing. Though that's the, those two things are always rubbing against each other for John Gray. And I think he's right that they rub against each other. Um, I also think that most people from different political perspectives are, are willing to like accept some version of that contradiction. From the right, they'll often say, Yes, liberalism is contradictory in this way, and so we need to recenter this particular form of morality, this particular hierarchy. We should stop trying to bring everybody into this thing because that's contradictory. Let's re-establish a certain moral framework in the world. Um, liberals themselves will often say, um, our, um, our whole political process, our managerial political process, is about managing this contradiction, doing the best we can in any particular situation. And then Chevy people like me will be like, yes! This is a central contradiction of liberalism that demands an entire upending of the state in order for justice to occur. Um, so, so I like working with that. Um, what happens when liberalism meets this contradiction? Um, I think the first thing it tends to do is deny that the contradiction is there. That type of person does not exist. This is the first move that any liberal institution will, would make, is to, is to deny that that thing is there. Um, trans people don't exist, let's not worry about them, they don't actually exist. And then you accept that they exist, but you say, we can't really have them in our institution, they're not really allowed to be here. So if you can't deny, then you exclude. If you can't exclude, then you can say, oh, 
we accept that they, we don't really like them. We accept that they exist. We accept that they're there. We tolerate them. We have tolerance for them. Um, if they must be in our spaces, then we'll tolerate that they're there. And if you stop being able to do that because of a move of social and political forces, then you might begin to adapt to allow them in. You might mm, install some gender neutral bathrooms. We're going to adapt this institution. You're not going to change the entire institution, but you're going to adapt the institution um, so that you can cope with this new, this new demographic that you've previously denied, excluded, accepted. Um, if that isn't enough, then you can move towards strategies of assimilation, um, which uh, where you where you integrate enough of <sighs> enough of the hitherto marginalised demographic um, to to maintain the existing hegemony. Um, you allow them to be a junior partner in the hegemonic process, which I would argue is what has happened to a rump of, of LGBT politics over the last 50 years, um, that from a set of radical demands, it's moved towards a generally assimilationist approach so that, so that LGBT people can become junior partners in business. Every so often, one of them might be an executive, you know, but, but they're, they're there and we accept them and we, we've adapted to them enough and they can be part of our ideology that has hitherto excluded them. That for me is how liberalism operates. Um, this is um, Elizabeth Pavanelli saying a version of the same thing from Economies of Abandonment using the term late liberalism. Late liberalism makes a space for culture to care for difference without disturbing key ways of configuring experience, ordinary habitual truths. So that's this claim about assimilation, that's this claim about how late liberalism works. And what I'm trying to say is that accessibility as a, pol as a policy tolerates um, cares for, in, uh, in Pavanelli's terms, accessibility cares for enough disability to maintain the habitual truth of abledness, or what Robert McGuire calls compulsory able-bodiedness. So we can maintain a view of the world or an approach to designing society that assumes everyone is able-bodied, despite the fact that um, if the majority of people aren't already disabled, then they will be eventually. Despite that, basic element of existence, we maintain the habitual truth of abledness by implementing accessibility. And so I come with this conclusion, accessibility policies are non-performative, and I'll come back to that later, non-performative utopias of inclusion. Um, utopia, um, as Thomas More writes it originally, is a deliberate pun. Um, the, the, the etymology means both no place and happy place. It means both of those things at once. So a, a happy no place where everyone gets the experience that everyone should have. This cannot happen, but the utopia of inclusion says that it does. Everyone gets the experience that everyone should have. And imagining that utopia, having a policy for that utopia, hides everyone who's not there and the experience that could be. Instead of changing what the experience is, instead of changing what the world is, we try and give access to the world as it already exists. So that's my, my sort of provocation around access. Whew! Okay. I thought I would start with the most theoretical bit, because that's apparently how one is supposed to structure these things. So I'll talk about something a little bit more um, meaty, concrete for a bit. Um, I want to just look at two projects that I've been involved with as an artist, as an artist who produces other artists. Um, and I'm using this term... Um, presenting or presenting what happens when the presentation is done from a disabled perspective when you are making present disabled people um, so I um, I'm just going to turn down the lights for a minute so you can see this lovely picture um, I co-direct um, an arts platform in Edinburgh called Anatomy we've been going for about six years um, this is us hosting one of our events that's me on, on, on the right that's my co-director Ali Maloney on the left, and that's our um, our regular BSL British Sign Language interpreter, um, Yvonne Waddle, um, in the middle, um, which is where she always is when the three of us are on stage, um, which is a deliberate strategy. Now, if any of you have ever gone to uh, a piece of theatre that has BSL interpretation, um, you'll usually find that the BSL interpreter is at the back, <laughs> on on the right or the left, or at the front on the right or the left. Um, somewhere where they are very obviously not part of the main piece of action. And one of the things that we try to do with anatomy, um, which happens every three months, um, and which every single event that we do has full BSL interpretation of the whole thing, um, 
is to is to counter that by always bringing Yvonne um, into the centre of the action, um, so that um, this particular form of accessibility, which is where the entire piece is always translated into another language or interpreted into another language, British Sign Language, um, where that is centred in how the whole thing is presented aesthetically, um, so that it's not just access, it's not just disability access, but disabled presenting or disabled presenting. But um, some of you might have noticed the deep irony of this otherwise beautiful, <laughs> beautiful photo. Is, we're doing this whole thing in front of a bunch of music stands. <laughs> Did anyone notice this? No. It just, it just passed you by. Um, now, music is a bit of a problem for disability access, um, for deaf access, because uh, you can't hear it. Um, actually, that's not quite true. Um, you can do all sorts of interesting things with music and deaf and hard of hearing access. Um, you can do things like um, putting speakers on the floor so that rhythms can be felt and especially bass beats can be felt. Um, there's, there's other kind of interesting things you can do around the visualisation of music. But in this particular case, we didn't do any of that. Um, we, in that particular show, we had this one piece where we could not make this deaf accessible. Um, if anyone doesn't know this, um, just as a brief note, this um, D slash deaf, um, there, there's a contest around deaf identity and deaf with a capital D tends to refer to deaf identity and deaf culture um, and deaf with a lowercase d uh, tends to refer to deaf or deaf and hard of hearing people who don't necessarily identify with that culture. I can talk to you about length, uh, at length about that if you like. Um, that piece of language is a, a complicated bit of compromise around the political contest. Um, this is our uh, sort of inclusion statement which can be equally critiqued and equally problematized. Um, that's framing all of this work. Um, and I kind of wanted to, um, to mention this is something that I'm, I'm proud of. This isn't the only access thing that we do. It's a thing that I'm proud of, but that I also see the limitations of. Um, you're trying to make a, a whole set of, and anatomy is a multi-art form cabaret. There's all sorts of different forms of art going on in there. Sound art and music is often a part of that, and we, we haven't worked out how to do that. And how to do that within this particular access context creates a contradiction for us, and I think that contradiction is important. Um, so I would ask of us, and of everybody else, what are some of the possible approaches to that? Do we programme no art that isn't fully deaf accessible? Um, do we just not have things that are only music? Because we're, um, we tend to focus on cross-genre work, we almost never have a piece that is purely sound-based. It's usually sound and visual, or sound and movement, though there's still a problem there. Do we just accept no art that doesn't have a deaf accessible component? Do we adapt to all art to be deaf accessible? Do we only work with musicians if they can do this thing? Um, or do we accept not every audience member is going to be able to access every aspect of this art form. So let's create some art that's specifically centred around this disability. And we have done this in the past, where we might have a, a night that includes a piece of music that not everyone can necessarily enjoy. And then we might have um, a poem in British Sign Language that we do not interpret into English deliberately, so that there's something else where the hearing audience um, can only appreciate the visual aspect of it and has, really doesn't know what the language is. Um, so that's another thing that we can do. Then what happens if you try and incorporate another level of accessibility, and we haven't done this yet, when you are trying to be accessible, and again, remember this critique of accessibility being inclusion in what already exists rather than transforming what exists. What if we want to be better accessible to a blind audience um, or a partially sighted audience? How do we include both BSL interpretation and audio description, which is a form of blind accessibility, um, into everything that we do. And how do we do that when we are already operating on a shoestring and can barely like muster the economic and social resources to make this thing happen? Um, what I'm trying to suggest is that proper, not access, but integration of this kind of disability access requires not just adding in a thing, not just adding in a BSL interpreter, but complete aesthetic overhaul of what you're doing. You have to rethink what art is and how art works if you want to do this properly. And that also requires quite a lot of money, which we tend not to have. The broad question there is, um, and this is a metaphor as well as a, a reality, where are the stairs in every theatre? 
what are the things that some people cannot get past? What kinds of curb cutting, curb cuts are those ramps in the pavement um, that were mostly created for uh, people in wheelchairs, but tend to be really useful for everybody else, <laughs> um, from skateboarders to people pushing buggies to people who are having to haul massive loads down the pavement. Um, what curb cutting does the owner need? Just to quickly look at another thing that I've done, and I'll take these lights down again. Um, uh, so my particular, I'll talk about revelation later if I've got time. My particular um, disability or the thing that brings uh, me into this space is, is Asperger's. Um, and I am really interested in autistic sociality um, and how that rubs up against dominant forms of sociality in the arts. So um, this is a project that I've done iteratively with different arts organisations. Um, I don't like the name, I need a new name for it, but it is creating within big, noisy, fancy art parties, a corner of the space or sometimes an entire room or sometimes half the space that is calm and quiet um, and has all sorts of things in it that are quite nice for various different types of autistic people. Um, some of the things that you can see in this picture um, are a bookshelf and some board games um, and some, some nice fabrics, um, which I could explain another time, and low level lighting. Um, some, there's also some social technologies in this space. Um, ear protection um, is a really nice thing to apply to arts parties because there's so often really loud music that just drives some people away. Some people love it. Um, this is a social technology that's often used at autism conferences of colour communication badges. Um, green means chat to me anytime. I'm happy to talk. You can initiate conversation. I can initiate conversation. That's great. Um, yellow is I'm, sometimes I'm happy to talk, but I'd rather I initiate conversation with you rather than the other way around, just so I could manage it a little bit better. Um, and red means just don't talk to me. I'm, I'm non-verbal at the moment. I don't want to speak. Um, reasoning around that um, is different autistic people at different levels struggle with different <laughs> types of social communication. Some autistic people are completely nonverbal. Um, some panic at unexpected social interaction. Some need to manage social interaction in specific ways. Um, and this requires, um, for this to work, it requires everybody who's in that space, autistic or non-autistic, to wear one of these badges for everyone to say, this is how I want to communicate in the world. This is a piece of social design, a social technology, um, to change what social space is. Um, and it has all sorts of interesting effects, um, because it's not just autistic people that are like awkward and uncertain at parties. Um, uh, if everyone around you is wearing a green badge, it's whether you're autistic or not, it's suddenly a little bit easier to be like, oh, you're in, enjoying this party. Didn't really know how to talk to a person, but I see you're wearing a green badge, so I suppose I'll give it a shot. If you're worried that somebody doesn't want to talk to you, the fact that they're just wearing a yellow badge or a red badge, like, is such a massive reduction in anxiety. It's like, oh, it's not me. They just don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so uh, this is the thing that I said um, when I was designing this first is I've got a page on my website about it. Um, being professionally social or socially professional is a form of advantage in the art world. But equally, many artists are reclusive, shy, awkward, anxious, uncertain or neurodiverse. That's the like, term of art that ar arises from autistic space but has come to other forms of mental difference. How can the art world provide social space to many different kinds of people together? What I'm doing is using autism-centred design to create an alternate social space alongside and abrading against neurotypical sociality. Um, this is mostly quite a nice, cuddly project, but when um, an arts institution comes to me um, and asks me to like facilitate one of these spaces at their arts event, um, I say I will totally do that. Um, it can't just be in a separate room. Everybody else has to know that it's there <laughs> and see that it's there. It's a requirement for me that everybody can see that there is a different sort of socialising going on. And that's a creation of another world alongside the world that already exists and trying to let those abrasions happen. Centering design on one minority population shifts the possibilities for all populations and exposes the comp compulsory able-bodiedness, that's Robert McGrew's term again, of the received space. Um, so what I'm trying to say there is that by doing this autism centred thing, you get all of these unexpected benefits for other people. 
Um, just as when you create curb, cut, curb cuts in as many pavements as possible, it's suddenly a lot easier for people who are pushing buggies to negotiate the city space. Um, all spaces are already exclusive. There is no 100% inclusive space. There is no pure accessible social design. So what we can do instead is make conscious design choices about what and who is excluded. Some people are not going to find the chill out corner remotely <laughs> relaxing. Like they're sitting on comfortable armchairs and talking quietly and playing board games. I cannot handle that socialization. Like there are people who could not handle that socialization. And for me, that's totally fine because they've got a different form of socialization to go to over there. When you exclude particular people, behaviours and norms, the norm that anyone can just chat to anyone at any time, no, we're going to govern this with this complicated new communication badge thing, um, different people, behaviours and norms um, can emerge. Um, I want to go back to doing some of this, like, let's look at some policy work and talk about this often talked about, usually misunderstood, very contested issue of safer spaces. Um, I've, I've dropped, dropped your name a few times um, and it's worth saying that my approach to looking at policy um, is really informed by Sarah Ahmed's work on non-performativity. Um, she has at least two essays on non-performativity, one of which I link to in, in, in the notes here, um, that are well worth a read where she looks at um, equal opportunities policies specifically around racial diversity and how they work in the nitty gritty to exclude um, people of colour from the institution being examined. And that's kind of really shaped my approach to access policy, and in this case, safer spaces policy. Um, this is my biased, partial, partial in both senses. Um, my understanding of safer spaces comes from seeing them emerge from the sort of political space that I was used to like direct action camps and anarchist conferences and like growing up with those um like 15 years ago and then in the last five years finding them suddenly like be part of like articles in the telegraph i'm like when did the telegraph know about safer spaces like this is a thing that we just did at climate camp 15 years ago this is weird and um, they've become part of a mainstream conversation and it's it's been like astonishing and confusing to me how that's happened um, and i'm really interested in that my understanding of safer spaces has its origins in transformative justice movements, um, which has been led by organisations like Incite, um, looking particularly at issues like domestic violence and all forms of, of, of social violence, especially within minority or marginalised community. Um, Incite Women of Colour Against Violence are the most pioneering organisation that I know of in, in, that, um, in that field. Um, and the Colour of Violence, the Insight Anthology, is um, a, a good text for looking at the, the history goes quite a long way back, but that's a good text for looking at the history of it. Um, transformative justice um, is an idea that emerges especially from heavily policed minority groups saying, clearly um, a carceral system, a prison system, a police system is not working for our community. Clearly this is a way of maintaining um, racial discrimination, impoverishment, clearly it is not stopping violence in our communities. We need something else. How do we transform justice? What kinds of justice can come from and be led by our communities? Um, it tends to transform it if justice tends to involve, uh, avoid punitive measure, measures, certainly tends to avoid incarceration um, and the involvement of the state monopoly of violence, aka the police. Um, and look for community facilitated processes of personal and social transformation. And from that place, through forms of social interaction, it disseminates through various anti-authoritarian activist movements. Um, and an interesting comparator here is consensus decision making as an ideology, which some of you who have engaged with student activism might have come across. Um, consensus decision making can be tracked um, really closely back to um, particular moments in peace and anti-nuclear movements, especially with like meetings between Quakers and other forms of peace and anti-nuclear movements. Um, you can see conversations about um, uh, consensus decision making at Three Mile Island um, and you see it come from there and then spread all the way through anti-authoritarian movements and then from there it comes to the students and from there you occasionally start to see it at business meetings and I'm like what? Like, why are people doing hand signals at this meeting about business strategy? Anyway, 
back to safer spaces. So you start finding it in various forms of anti-authoritarian activist movements. Um, the revolution starts at home. It's again looking at issues of partner violence, intimate partner violence within those communities. And from there, they come into student movements. Um, and as with lots of things that happen within a student milieu with kind of new trendy youth aligned arts events. And in these places, I find they tend to move from a processual process. Transformative justice is a process of transforming a group, transforming a society, transforming a person to something that's more juridical, more based in policy, more based in various forms of law, whether that's um, actual national law or internal laws of social groups. Um, and I'll look at that in a moment. And from there, once it starts being a student-y thing, it becomes this like immensely triggering word for all sorts of reactionaries. It's like you can say safe spaces and suddenly they have a meltdown and start freaking out about free speech. It's hilarious. Um, it's really nice triggering reactionaries um, by saying just these two words like safe space. Whoa. So they notice what's going on and it becomes this trigger that people start talking about in all sorts of confusing and different ways. That's my partial history of it. Um, as with the the accessibility policies, I want to look at the vision statements of Safer Spaces. So this is a, a Safer Spaces, the start of a Safer Spaces policy from a, a dance and DJ event called Queer Mafia. And it goes like this. I can't read the whole thing, but um, Queer Mafia works towards recognising dynamics of power and privilege that exist within society and which have historically oppressed our communities. We believe that these same dynamics and tensions exist within our own communities and we are working continuously towards addressing these tensions and creating supportive spaces. Um, our spaces are not spaces for violence, racism, sexism, ageism, transphobia, cissexism, sizeism, fatphobia, sexual harassment and gender policing or doing anything to another person without their consent. QM reserves the right to assess and manage circumstances and situations in the best interest of our collective vision towards creating liberation, in scare quotes, and safer, in scare quotes, spaces. We don't believe in zero tolerance, but we do believe in accountability and spaces of support. Um, and it goes on. And I, I just, I want to show you this. And like, I'm being a bit ironical about it, but I actually think this is incredible. Like, I think this is a beautiful document. So that's just the start. <laughs> of this safer spaces policy like that is the and it includes like a whole bunch of stuff about how safer spaces policies can't exist this whole thing is a contradiction and then we have a section on anti-racism and anti-oppression bullying and violence consent respect like it goes on and on and on and on it is this incredibly involved set of social guidelines suggestions around processes what kind of things they might do if something goes wrong like it's an entire visionary design of what a social space could be that they're trying to describe a name and through describing and naming it discover it is completely impossible to do that so that is for me a kind of um safer spaces policy that really understands the origins of safer spaces within transformative justice movements so i want to shift from there um some of the aspects of it um, it names the kind of problem, so it has a politics, it has a specific politics that it is trying to enact through policy, through social design, through establishing social conventions. Names the problem, names the politics, and is process-oriented. It's always talking about transformation, it's always talking about how it's going to try and implement this stuff. It explicitly excludes behaviours and talks about who is centred. It is centering queer people, it is centering people of colour, um, and it is saying these are not spaces for this stuff, for violence, racism, sexism. It's excluding behaviours. It's not including everyone, it's excluding behaviours. So, to look at what then happens to safer spaces, here we go. This is from UWE Students' Union. This Students' Union believes the student, Students' Union is committed to providing an inclusive, there's that word again, and supportive space for all students. It's not centering particular groups, it's for all. Remember that word, all, from access. This policy, top policy is applicable to our whole student community, whether an individual or a member within a group. We all aspire to provide an environment where students can express their views, free from discrimination, harassment and bullying. Freedom of speech should be respected as well as recognising its boundaries. We must respect our diverse population and take a zero tolerance approach to discrimination in any term. Now remember, 
that the ostensibly much more radical political statement that had a really expressed polit uh, politics to it, a really expressed radical politics to it, said, we don't believe in zero tolerance. But this, this piece of ridiculously bland liberalism that says nothing, like it literally says nothing, says that it's going to be zero tolerance. So isn't, I think that's really worth thinking about. Like, if you're processual, if you're radical about it, if you're transformative about it, you know that zero tolerance doesn't work. If you're trying not to do anything, if you're trying to be non-performative, then you say you're going to have a zero tolerance approach. Um, the, uh, the reason that I say it's, it says nothing is, is the contradiction between three and four. Um, it wants everyone to express their views free from discrimination, harassment and bullying, but freedom of speech should be respected and it has boundaries. These words mean nothing as outside of the particular processes of political contestation that are defining what freedom of speech is, what the boundaries of freedom of speech are, what discrimination is, what bullying is, what harassment is. It doesn't define any of the terms, so it means nothing. And just as those terms reasonableness um, and comparable in that first accessibility policy are pliable non-specifics, terms of contestation, terms that require political contest, social processes in order to mean anything, we have these pliable boundaries that can be moved around. The students' union is dominated by lefties and they're going to use these pliable terms in order to try and stop inviting, like, I don't know, Milo Yiannopoulos to speak at the university. If the students' union is dominated by conservatives, then they're going to use these terms to Probably, and this does happen, and this happened at Bristol to try and shut down um, a group of trans students um, starting a petition. Like, Safer Spaces was invoked in Bristol recently. I'll, I'll look up the details if anyone's interested. In order to punish a trans student for starting a petition. Um, it's juridical in orientation. It's, trying to, it's not trying to initiate processes. It's trying to, by naming a bunch of principles, make those principles happen in reality. Um, here is finally this definition of non-performative that I keep referring to, and it is what's going on in that policy. Um, and this is from Sarah Ahmed's Non-Performativity of Anti-Racism. Such speech acts do not do what they say. They do not commit a person, organisation or state to an action. My argument is simple. They are non-performatives. This term performative goes back to the linguistics researcher Austin and has a particular role um, as you may know, in, in queer theory, and then becomes used by Butler, most notably, um, in understanding how gender works as a performative act, as a performative speech act. For Austin, a performative refers to a particular class of speech. An utterance is performative when it does what it says. An example being, I declare thee man and wife. Um, I promise I will do this. Um, I sentence you to death, performative statements. I want to suggest that non-performative speech acts work by not bringing about the effects that they name. In my model of the non-performative, the failure of the speech act to do what it says is not a failure of intent or even circumstance, but is actually what the speech act is doing. The access policy, the inclusion policy, the safer spaces policy deliberately works to make a thing not happen. Such speech acts work as if they bring about what they name, or to be more precise, such speech acts are taken up as if they are performatives, which has its own effect. So we have a diversity policy, therefore we are now diverse. And by having a diversity policy and becoming diverse, we don't have to do anything about diversity. Ditto, safer spaces policies, I think, usually. Um, whether or not any given safer spaces policy is non And I, I should say that I, um, I really believe in safer spaces processes and I spent five years of my life facilitating transformative justice and safer spaces processes for a social centre in Edinburgh, with a social centre in Edinburgh, as part of a team. I've committed a huge amount of personal resources to this and I still believe in them. Um, but whether or not any given safer spaces policy is non-performative depends on conditions not legible in the text. People processes, expectations. The policy makes nothing happen and sometimes by me having a policy you deliberately stop things from happening. Safer spaces only occur if there is a team of people willing to actually do something when there's sexual harassment. Willing to actually initiate a process of personal transformation when someone is racist in your activist group. If those people aren't there, if that experience isn't there, if the processes aren't there, then just saying we're anti-racist means nothing. 
If you don't know what to do when somebody does sexual harassment, then saying this isn't a space for harassment does nothing. It's not about the policy. It's about the people that can do something with the policy. So without those people, without those processes, without that willingness to engage in transformative change, the policy acts as a performative, uh, with my nod to my enemies again, virtue signal that starts the process of making a safe space. So a policy could begin that process if the people are there to begin that process. But if left as merely a policy, it is non-performative. The question here is what happens when something goes wrong? You have a policy, you've said, we are a safe space. As soon as I see those words, I know it's not a safe space. Like if they say, we are a safe space, I know it's not gonna be a safe space because it means they're not gonna do anything. Um, because it means they haven't thought about what something goes wrong. No space is safe. You can only engage in the process of making a safe safer. No space is safer for everyone. You can only engage in the process of making a safe space safer for specific groups of people. I don't want my spaces to be safe for white supremacists. Why would I want my places to be safe for white supremacists? I'm going to kick them out. I want to exclude them. <laughs> right? I'm not making a safer space for everyone, which is what the EWE um, policy said. I'm deliberately excluding people so that a particular type of person can emerge, so that a particular policy can emerge, so that a particular politics can emerge. And that can only happen through exclusion, not through this utopia of inclusion, but through saying that these behaviours are excluded. That said, we don't believe in zero tolerance. So if we have the resources, we engage in a process of transformation. Rather than just kicking everyone out, we would like to work for transformation. But the nitty gritty of that is a lifetime's work. And I could talk about that for a long time. Um, I was gonna go back to John Gray, but I only have a few minutes left. So mm, I'm not gonna go back to John Gray because who wants to listen to more John Gray? Um, uh, uh, so I'm just skipping this bit so we can talk about something else. Um, no, I think I've said what I wanted to say about safe spaces. Um, if we have time in the discussion, I'll talk about John Gray's reactionary opinion of safe spaces and how it's actually quite interesting, but let's talk about something else. Mm. So I want to conclude um, with a little, a bunch of trans stuff for fun. And uh, I thought having just ranted at you quite aggressively about safe spaces, we should listen to a little song. Here we go. Can you hear that? Is that okay? Have you got a minute? Good. Well, just sit down and relax and let me tell you about my operation. <laughs> oh, this is the real dirt. Of course I had it done. To all of you that know me, you might have seen it coming. <laughs> so this will be no surprise. Everyone asks me, how does it feel? Well, it feels just fine to me. I can be the woman I've always wanted to be. For the change, I went south of the border. It took me just days to pack. I arrived there with excess baggage, but I had a lot less coming back. Um, uh, I'll pause it there. Uh, for my change, I went south of the border. Uh, it took me three days to pack. I had plenty of excess baggage and a lot less coming back. Um, so this is Ray Bourbon, um, an early female impersonator, drag performer, possible trans person. We really do not know. We don't know how she identified because she identified in a hundred different ways at different points in her career. We do not know if she actually had this operation that she talked about or not. Um, shortly after Christine Jorgensen um, had her dramatic revelation of the operation being done at this hyper mediatized moment of trans exposure. Um, Ray Bourbon, who had been a long time and really very well known at the time, female impersonator, that was the term that was used by her and for her at the time, um, decided to have the operation herself, or at least said she wanted the operation herself. The operation, we didn't really know what kind of operation it was, it was the operation. Um, we don't really have definite documentation of whether it happened or not, but she started releasing records and doing entire shows about having had an operation without ever telling you what that operation was and constantly revealing and concealing um, what that operation might have been, including in this beautiful song, Let Me Tell You About My Operation, which, which is, is, is extremely problematic in the best possible way. Um, this is a quote from um, Morgan M. Page, um, who has a trans history podcast called One from the Vaults that is phenomenal and free and I highly recommend um, and maybe start with this episode because it's hilarious. Her life story has been so embellished 
not least of which by herself, that telling fact from fantasy is now impossible. These things are definitely all true. A Broadway actress, singer, convicted murderer, actually true, novelist and all-round entertainer, this person may or may not have been trans. And I am interested in, and this, I know it seems like I've gone off on a ridiculous tangent right at the end. I am interested in how cultural protocols of um, hiding and disclosure, which are incredibly familiar to trans people, as well as LGBT people, LGBT people generally, LGB people generally, um, are related to this, this idea of access liberalism. Um, we have this idea that everyone should be included, that everyone should come along to the thing, that everyone should be safe, which is what I've been trying to say can't happen. Um, and we also have this idea that all information should be possible, should be accessible. Information wants to be free. Let's have Wikipedia, let's have archive.org. And I'm interested in what happens when spaces are not safe, when spaces exclude people, and when information is kept from you. And Ray Bourbon for me, this um, drag queen slash female impersonator slash trans woman slash whatever engaged in this lifelong process of lying, making shit up, telling you the truth but making it sound like a lie, telling you she had an operation when she hadn't but maybe she had but you didn't know and that, that process, that performance, that public life um, is both of those things at once. It's the revelation um, and it's also the refusal of information and having both of those things at once I think is, is central to trans existence. Um, so this is going to be a, a little quick um, and uh, slightly eccentric end to the rant. Um, I was listening to Tom Waits at the time and, and find this song hilarious while considering what's he building in there. You should listen to what's he building in there. Trans life depends on multiple moments of disclosure and non-disclosure. So say you're looking for a sexual partner, do you tell that sexual partner or not something about your trans status? Um, not disclosing can mean death. The trans panic defence is still a legal defence in some situations. So you don't tell somebody that you're trans and you're, let's say, a passing trans woman or a passing trans man and you're beginning to engage in sexual acti activity and your sexual partner um, believes they've been deceived and murders you. This still happens. This is a part of trans history. Silence equals death, but silence also equals sex. Because try disclosing to potential part potential partners that you're trans, and see how many of them run out of the door. This um, this this binary silence equals death, silence equals sex. Um, I'm stealing from um, a gay activist um, who uh, silence equals death. You might know is a very provocative um, poster from um, the AIDS crisis. Um, not talking about AIDS meant death um, for people with AIDS, mostly gay men, not entirely. Um, Recently, a Canadian artist um, came out with a new poster that said silence equals sex to talk about seraphobia. Um, uh, he's HIV positive. He's very, uh, he will say, you know, I'm trying to be very responsible and tell everyone that I'm HIV positive. But as soon as I disclose that, my possible sexual partner runs out the door. So this, this act of disclosure is this, uh, and that inhibits disclosure, right? Um, similarly, um, trans life in, uh, the world that we live in, in the Anglosphere at least, um, has been constantly mediated through this act of trans autobiography. Um, the trans autobiography is a whole genre of literature where we reveal our operations, our details about ourselves. It's this kind of striptease that continues like off the stage onto the page. Like you, you write an autobiography for a prurient cis audience saying this is what's happened in my life, this is the way that I'm trans, this is my revelation to the world. Um, what uh, Caitlyn Jenner did is, is, is completely indistinguishable as a media event from what Christine Jorgensen did about 50 years earlier. Like it felt, it felt like going in loops. This moment of dramatic revela revelation to the world. Call Me Kate is a moment of revelation to the world. But while this like public act of trans autobiography continues to happen, a lot of trans art has actually always been about conceal concealment, as with Ray Borben, confusing things making people not really know what's going on in there. What's he building in there? We have a right to know, but I'm not going to tell you. People want to know what's under your skirts. Um, and you might want to tell them. But a lot of trans art has been about refusing to tell people what's under your skirts or your binder. Um, this is now replayed 
on Time Magazine, but also on Twitter. I'm fascinated by this like moment that we've hit on Twitter, where like young trendy queer people will like list all of their like marginal affiliations and like so you know their pronouns, you know which particular minority groups they belong to, so you you can see what like which conversations they're allowed to have and which conversations they're not allowed to have. Um, this this like dramatic disclosure that happens at the moment that you see a person, your pronoun badges. I hate pronoun badges so much. Um, you, you go around in a circle and so you have this moment of disclosure and yet also on Twitter um, you can have this dramatic non-disclosure um, of multiple accounts of bots of, um, of, of concealing aspects of your identity in order to be able to say things. And then the last version of this disclosure, non-disclosure that's worth referencing, and I know I'm just like piling a bunch of cultural signifiers at you just to give you something to think about that's totally different at the end. Um, how do you get information specifically healthcare information to people who need it without damaging access to services. So say um, you've got a, a trans masculine friend who desperately has access to testosterone, can't wait the three years it's going to take him to get um, the GIC appointment. You need him to know um, where he can get testosterone from. You know where he can get testosterone from. But if you post it on Twitter, that testosterone is going to vanish. Right? So you have to get that information to him, but you have to exclude access to that information from other people. Um, there's all sorts of, um, in Fred Moten's terms, undercommons. There's all sorts of hidden realms of knowledge in the trans community um, uh, that, that you need people to know exist. You need our people to know it exists, but you don't want anybody else to know it exists because letting people know that it exists is damaging. Um, one of the most supportive GPs in the UK for trans people is Helen Weberly. Um, she's also a campaigning GP. Um, because she's a campaigning GP, she got barred for six months on having clients who were under 16, I think, because she was one of the easiest way for people who were under 16 to get access to hormone blockers. But because she was publicly available as that, that got shut down for a while. So disclosure, non-disclosure. What life is made possible by excluding access to information and participation. Um, not by including everyone, not by saying everyone's welcome, but by saying you can't come to this, this behaviour is not welcome, you don't have access to this information. Um, infosec is a, a trendy term for information security, um, as in like who do you need to know stuff. Um, the ceremony may not be recorded, the dinner may not be attended, the meeting may not be declared, you know it's happening but you don't know what's happening. Um, so this term cultural protocol is something that I know from um, doing some projects with um, indigenous people mostly in North America, Turtle Island. Um, there are often ceremonies in that context that cannot be recorded and must not be recorded and should not be recorded. That you only know what happens in that ceremony if you have the right to know what happens in that ceremony. Um, and, and to record that information is to do cultural damage, is to, is to do something terribly wrong. Um, the meeting may not be declared. If you're involved in, let's say, militant and anti-fascism, you need to get a bunch of people together to talk about what you're going to do because the Scottish Defence League is turning up on the Royal Mile tomorrow. Um, but you, only, you, you can only have the right people there because if the police know you're there, then you can't do the thing that you need to do. So, the, so you need to know that the meeting's happening if you need to know that the meeting's happening. But if you don't need to know that the meeting's happening, you shouldn't know that the meeting's happening. And if you do know the meeting's happening, but we're not sure about you, you should know that it's happening, but not know what's going on in it. That was sort of deliberately confusing. Um, so the suggestion here is that against the idea of the total global commons, and I really shouldn't have tried to squeeze in this idea about information alongside all this stuff around access, but whatever. This is an early bunch of ideas and I hope you like them. Against this idea of a total global commons, against a universal liberal project of borderless capitalism, borders for people, no borders for money, um, against the idea that everyone can be included, we can suggest that some information does not want to be free, some spaces do not want to be safe, some things you should not have access to. The implication here is that we're defining from the margins our own borders and our own boundaries in order to destroy the borders and boundaries of the state. It's not utopian, it's the opposite of utopian, but it is idealistic. We're not trying to create a no place, a happy no place where everyone can be included. We are trying idealistically 
to redefine, to reshape, to remake what reality is through processes, not of inclusion, but through deliberate and chosen exclusion. Okay, thank you. Okay.